continue the book of Acts in this extended story that began in chapter 3 with the healing of a formerly crippled man by Peter and John, causing quite a stir in the temple. Last week, the religious rulers had arrested Peter and John so that they could interrogate them, give them the old uh, elbow in the ribs in the back room. And so, uh, as we discussed, Peter stood in front of them in that gathering and proclaimed Christ. Anybody remember talking about that last Sunday? He proclaimed Christ to them, and so this entailed the death, the resurrection of Christ, the call to respond, and also uh, the insistence that Christ alone can save. And as the dust settles, you can sense in the text that the ball shifts back to the leader's court. Peter and John have said their piece, and so now the response will come from the leaders. Um, And that's where our text begins today. So I love how Luke starts this very next sentence. If you'll look in Acts 4.13... You'll see that it says, now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, that's how it starts. That's the first thing they noticed, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John. Now you probably remember last week's message, it was a bold message. Christ, the cornerstone, rejected by the builders, salvation, no one else, that's a bold message. And they're shocked at the bold proclamation of God's word. You see, there's a reason that I included the modifier, boldly. In our mission statement, uh, we boldly proclaim Christ. It's not because I'm a fan of adverbs, although I am. It's not because I'm a fan of Star Trek. It has nothing to do with that. Uh, it's because I'm a fan of the book of Acts. The proclamation of Christ in the book of Acts is accompanied by boldness. And I would argue the gospel is best transmitted boldly. There, there are some messages in life that you don't need boldness to be effective You don't need to boldly proclaim the lullaby to your kids before bed. You don't need to boldly proclaim the instructions on the manual to your lawnmower or the ingredients on a box of cereal. We can all agree to that. But the gospel is something to be heralded. That's why they had a herald. Uh, It's something that to be proclaimed with authority and with persuasiveness. It's not something about which we can be ambivalent in this life. So let's just say you don't want to be bold. Say, I don't want to do this. I do not, Pastor Jerry, I do not want to boldly proclaim the gospel. Okay, well, let's look at the alternative. What are the antonyms of the word bold? Well, the dictionary says, afraid, cautious, timid, cowardly, fearful. Is that how we are to effectively share the gospel with a dying world that, by the way, is quite convinced of their own worldview? Would that somehow help the gospel to go further, to be timid, afraid in our approach? Or would it muddy the waters? I think certainly it would be confusing confusing to the listeners of the gospel if we brought it with anything other than boldness. So boldness is not something that you can just conjure up, though, from a vacuum. You can't just wake up, I'm feeling bold today. It's not like feeling dangerous. You can feel dangerous. But you can't wake up and just feel bold. I guarantee you right now, if I had to give a presentation, I feel pretty bold right now, but if I had to give a presentation on, let's say, uh, designing computer code or women's fashion, cross-stitching, I promise you my boldness would begin to shrink as I began to talk. First, you take the the cross, then you take the stitch, you want to do this. No, I don't know what I'm talking about, clearly. So the boldness begins to, to shrink when you don't know what you're talking about. And so uh, that's not what Christians are called to do, is to just make up boldness or be uh, this bravado type person and and be a bully. That's not what being bold with the gospel is about. It's something much deeper than that. So last week we learned what it means to proclaim Christ. This week we're going to learn what it means to do so boldly. So today's text is going to show us how to be bold for Christ. Peter and John boldly proclaim Christ in the face of opposition. This was not a friendly environment they were talking. And it absolutely confounded the leaders. I think today we probably live in an era where boldness is needed, sorely needed and required. So let's study the source of that boldness now. If you would, before we look at the word, pray again with me. Heavenly Father, we come to you, a church of needy people, needing to hear a word from you today, needing a challenge. Lord, some of us have had difficult weeks. Some of us feel far from you right now. And so, Lord, I pray that your spirit would move in this room, 
draw us close and to teach us the things that you would have us to see. Convict and pierce when necessary, Lord. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So, that's right. We're going to be in Acts 4.13. If you want to go ahead and turn there. We're looking at three causes of Christian boldness today. And if these three things are true, I believe there is a causal relationship with being bold for Christ. So, uh, I'll just say before I get too far, part of my message could have included something from last week's text. So, if you look at Acts 4.8, it tells us that Peter, even when he began to speak, was filled with the Holy Spirit. I don't want to look past that. I don't want to negate that, but it just was in last week's message. So that could easily, if you want to write number four at the bottom of your outline and put filled with the Holy Spirit also, is very important. It just happened to be in last week's text. So that is our cause of Christian boldness, absolutely. So uh, today we're going to begin in Acts 4, 13, and I'll read this for you now, beginning with the leadership response. When they saw the boldness of Peter and John, and perceived that they were uneducated, common men. They were astonished, and they recognized that they had been with Jesus. We'll pause there. In case there's any doubt where Peter and John got all this boldness, the cat was now out of the bag. The toothpaste was now out of the tube. You can almost see the furrowed brows of these Jewish leaders, their big regal robes, and their nice Pope hats, Ten-gallon hats, wondering how these uneducated fishermen are handling the scriptures and handling them in such a high level of logic. How is this even possible? Then it begins to get them, oh wait, ah, that's right. I think these guys, yes, oh, these are the followers of Jesus. That's right. Well, great. It's almost like memories begin to flash back to their minds of Jesus teaching and arguing and winning Nobody able to withstand the authority that he brought to the Pharisees and the Sadducees as he stood and just spoke full of the Spirit. And, and now they thought it was over. They thought, oh, we put that guy out. We, we ended that. But now his two star pupils stand and it becomes quite apparent Jesus has passed the torch along to those that followed him. And so I'll begin by giving you the first cause, the first key to Christian boldness is number one, proximity to Christ. Proximity to Christ. The construction of Luke's sentence in Acts 4.13 uh, looks a bit like a math equation to me. I'll, I'll admit I'm not very good at math, but I can figure this much out. Uh, we start with bold, the boldness as the given. So left side of the equal sign. Boldness equals uneducated and common. That's our next variable. Then the next one, proximity to Jesus. Boldness equals uneducated, common, plus Proximity to Jesus. That's the math equation linguistically that we see here. So are we saying that being uneducated and being common is helpful to the gospel? Well, no, that's not really the point. The point is that it had no effect on the outcome. The outcome was that Peter and John had been with Jesus and nothing that was added or subtracted to that could take away from the fact that they were standing boldly and proclaiming. So you have these ultra-trained, ultra-educated, ultra-wealthy elites looking down their nose at Peter and John. And the words that Luke chose to characterize their disdain, you should hear disdain in these words, were Peter and John were a grammatoi. Anybody hear a word out of that? A grammatoi. What's the prefix A? It negates, right? Without grammar. Ah, grammatory. Now the next one is idiotes. We know what that one is, right? So that's what they said. Basically, these were unlearned idiots. Is what, that's what Luke said, that they said. And at the same time that they were condescending, they were also astonished at the unlearned idiots. So, let me just remind you of the Bible definition of boldness. It's confidence, plain speaking, frankness, Open clarity of speech or action. That's what it means to be bold. Now, it's when you speak in a way that makes your intentions clear. That makes your intentions clear. When you're bold, you speak in such a way that everyone knows what you're saying and why you're saying it. And that you're saying it. Young men should be bold when making your intentions clear to a young woman. Right? You should say, here's the plan. Here's where we're going to go. Here's how we're going to get there. Are you in? That's what bold 
Christian men should do when dating a young woman. Uh, so it's not about being a bully. It's not about being a bull in a china shop. It's not about being domineering. Don't hear that in boldness. Just because we're boldly proclaiming the word doesn't mean that we're like a hammer. No. We're like a scalpel. We're very clear with what we're doing. Being bold means that you are open and confident in what you're trying to do. And it became clear to these Jewish leaders that the sources of these men's boldness was that they had been with Jesus. That's where this came from. Now, you may not be able to spend time with Jesus in the flesh, hanging out around the campfire like the disciples did, but you can spend time with him in the spirit, reading his words, the words of scripture, through a relationship with him in prayer, communing with him. You can meditate on his words and teachings Part of what we're going to do today, communion, is a moment where you get to commune with Christ. You can connect with him in his presence. So what's the connection between closeness to Jesus and boldness? Well, first of all, if you're close to Jesus, you have actual authority in this life. When Jesus was commissioning his disciples, Matthew 28, 18, he said, all, what? All authority has been given to me. All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Therefore, go. How much authority, Brother Eric? It was all authority. That's right. Jesus has all authority. So if we base everything that we say off of his all authority, chances are we're going to pick up some authority. We can speak with authority if we are speaking the words of Christ because he had all authority. Second of all, if you have Jesus, you have the Spirit of God living with and inside you. You have God literally on your side. Shouldn't that encourage us to be bold in the world? We have God living in us, sharing with those that do not have God living with them. Lastly, if you spend time with Jesus, I believe you are well trained. Even though they said that they didn't have training, it was very clear that they actually did. If you put the four Gospels together and you really, really study the words of Jesus, all the ways that he used the Old Testament, all those parables, all the sermons, the way he handled his opposition, the way he showed compassion to the lost world, you're going to eventually be like Jesus if you study him enough. You will become. That's the, beauty, the beautiful thing about a Christian filled with the Spirit is that if it's working, if you really are a Christian, you eventually become like Jesus. That's the goal of having the Spirit to be conformed into the image of Christ. So, if you want to be bold for Christ, the first thing you need to do is get close to Him. Don't be shocked if you get out into the world and opportunities avail themselves for you to speak about Christ and you feel something inside just shutting down. Mm. First question you need to ask is, am I even close to Jesus? Don't get shocked when you're, when you're out and about and, and opportunities come and you miss them or you say no or you say not today or, don't be shocked if you're not even close to Jesus. That's number. That's step number one. That's bottom level of the ladder. That's rung number one. Am I even close to Jesus? The more you neglect Jesus, the more you will exhibit fear in this world. That goes for everything. Proximity to Christ emboldens. You ever had a you ever had a friend that was just really really bold or really tough? If you've hung out with me, the answer is yes. Uh, <laughs> I just want you to imagine, you know, you've got a friend that is extremely uh, strong and you have no fear when you hang out with this person. You can walk down the darkest alley and you, you got a little strut in your step because you know if it goes down, I got this guy to back me up. It's very similar if you spent time with Jesus. There's a confidence that comes along with being close to him. It rubs off. You you by extension of his authority, begin to speak with and think with authority in your life. Because you're saying his words. Just parrot Jesus. Just be the little parrot on the shoulder. And that's okay. And you'll have more authority than any, any politician, king, ruler, emperor ever lived. If you just parrot Jesus, you've got more than they've ever had. Okay? Now, that's just one of the causes for boldness. If we'll look at Acts 4, 14 through 16, we'll see the next point. Read with me, Acts 4, 14. But seeing the man who was healed beside them, they had nothing to say in opposition. Nothing to say. And when they had commanded them to leave the council, they conferred with one another, saying, What should we do with these men? For that a notable sign has been performed through them is evident to all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and we cannot deny it. 
The next cause for Christian boldness, number two, personal experience. Personal experience makes us bold. Do you know what must have made this a really difficult moment for these Jewish leaders? They could not talk their way out of this issue, not as long as the man who was crippled from birth was standing there doing jumping jacks next to Peter during the sermon. That makes it very hard to talk your way out of what you see, you do not see. I mean, what, there's no way to get around that. Remember, this entire incident began with a man who throughout his life was paralyzed from the waist down and was sitting in the temple begging for money. And Jesus, through Peter, healed this man. He jumps up, starts telling everybody, looky, looky, look what happened to me. And Jesus did. It was Jesus. And so the whole sermon, he's standing there next to Peter and John as their personal amen section. Yep, amen, yes, it happened. Look, yes, the whole sermon. I need to get somebody. Carl, just one of these days, just stand right here. It would be nice. Um, and so the man who had been changed was a living testimony to the power of the message. So one way that we can experience boldness in our world is that we lean on the fact that Christ has personally changed us. Too often, Christ is proclaimed as some abstract theory. But don't forget to include that Christ, if you are a Christian, has actually changed you. Supposed to, right? That's how this is supposed to work. And I think that this is maybe one of the reasons that we don't share Christ more. There's just not a lot of change to talk about. That can, that can get uncomfortable. There's no before and after. You know, you don't want to turn on the TV and they're selling weight loss products. And, you know, before, you've got this big gut sticking out there, kind of like this one. And then after, it's the exact same gut sticking out there. You know what that doesn't do? Sell products. Because no one cares. If it, why would you spend money to look the exact same way? Now, we don't have a product, but listen to me. The world is looking to see if our lives actually reflect the message that we preach. We do that with everybody. If you're starting to see it in politics. People that are preaching the climate change, what's the first thing on the other side they start to do? Where, how'd you get here? On a big, uh, big jet, huh? Yeah, I know. See, people are starting, we've been bearing this forever. Christians have been bearing the practice which you preached in forever, but now people, other people are starting to have to, to live with it. When you start preaching, that's what happens. When you start preaching, accountability begins to come. That one was for free. So, um, I would ask, is your life exactly like the unbelieving world? Do you talk and act like them? Do your relationships and marriages and children look exactly like them? Or are you just an unbeliever caught up in church culture? Or have you been personally changed? Not riding on the coattails of somebody else in this room. Have you personally, you, you, been changed by Christ? Look at what John wrote in 1 John 1, 1 through 3. I have this up on the screen for you. As he gave the reason for his ministry. We've been talking about Peter. Let's get John in there, right? Here's what John said. That which was from the beginning, that which we have heard, we, we have seen with our eyes, which we looked upon and have touched with our hands concerning the word of life, that's Jesus. The life was made manifest and we have seen it and testified to it and proclaimed to you, there's that word, proclaimed to you eternal life, which was with the Father and was made manifest to us. That which we have seen and heard, we proclaim to you. What is John appealing to? What's his appeal? personal experience. I've seen it. I've touched him. I was there. I, I laid my head on his shoulder. I know Jesus. I was there. He had been personally changed. And if you have not been personally changed, if you don't believe in your own message, don't expect anybody else in your life to care. They will not care. But no one can take away that which you have personally experienced. Some of you have incredible stories, because I've heard some of them, that you should not be afraid to share with people. There were people whose marriages have been hanging on by a thread and through the power of Jesus saw restoration and reconciliation happen in your family. That should embolden you when you proclaim Christ, because you've seen the power. Some of you have battled actual, real addictions in your life and thought that you would be something you dealt with every day until you died. But through the power of Jesus, you've been freed from that addiction, and that should embolden you when you proclaim Christ, because you have experienced his power. 
Some of you were once atheistic, agnostic, or extremely apathetic to spiritual things, but now you're hungry for the Word, looking to get involved here, looking to serve Jesus. That should embolden you because you have a changed life. Some of you know what it's like to feel your life teetering on the edge of meaninglessness. You feel like you've wasted your entire life. You've gone through and just gone through motions and you look up one day and say, I've wasted it. But as soon as you discovered the gospel of Jesus Christ, you had a purpose and a joy and a vision for a new life. That should embolden you because you've personally experienced change. You see, if there's been a life change, it's going to make you bold. Christianity isn't just a belief system to you because you've lived it. It's, it's the only reason that you're not a complete mess in this life. It's the only reason that you have meaning and you have purpose. Proclaiming Christ from a place of personal change will create boldness, I promise you. You are going to be cowardly about something that has actually happened to you and changed your life. Has somebody ever tried to tell you uh, something, but you were actually there and you could, and you could confound their claim? Say, oh, well, did you know that restaurant shut down? Wait, I was just there today. No, no, it, they shut that place down. I just had lunch there 10 minutes ago. No, no, I'm telling you, I saw it online. You know what you can boldly say? No, I was there. I experienced it. And in your life, you can take that same boldness. No, I have experienced Christ. I know what he does. I know his power. I've seen him work in my life and in my church. Let me tell you who Jesus is because I've lived it. That's powerful. That creates boldness. So boldness comes from proximity. It comes from personal experience. And lastly, it comes from a perspective of fear. A proper perspective of fear. Let me explain what this means in a moment. Uh, having a proper perspective of fear causes you to be bold. If we look again at our final section of the text, Acts 4, 17 through 22. Leaders are still talking. But in order that it may spread no further among the people, let us warn them to speak no more to anyone in this name. That's Jesus. So they called them and charged them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered them, Whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than God, you must be the judge. For we cannot but speak of what we have seen and heard. And when they had further threatened them, they let them go, finding no way to punish them because of the people. For all were praising God for what had happened. For the man of whom this sign of healing was performed was more than 40 years old. And so this Jewish council does what everyone does when they can't win an argument on merit. They go to suppressing. They go to persecution. If you were the Jewish leaders, you have a few problems here. You've got a Messiah movement spreading. You've got miracles happening that you can't ignore. And you've got a runaway growth happening. People leaving Judaism and following after Jesus in your temple. You can't win through debate because there are eyewitnesses and miracles happening. And so you must do what every unbeliever who has ever lived has ever done. What Romans 1 says that everyone who denies God does. You suppress the truth. That's what you have to do. You don't deal with the claims. You don't explore the merits of the claims. You suppress the truth, meaning that you plug your ears and say, la, 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 I cannot hear you. And you declare that which is obvious not to be true. And any thoughts that are said that are contrary, you just shove it back down inside. Nope, mm -mm, nope, deny, I deny that, I deny that. And you just continue to suppress the truth. And here's what the, Jew, uh, the Jews are doing here. They ask Peter and John to participate in suppression. Hey guys, you're going to go out there and you're going to stop talking about Jesus effective immediately. Or else. Or else. And verse 17 says that they warned them. Now, when I first read this text, I thought, eh, that's kind of soft. Or else. Okay, or what? But if you keep reading... The Greek word actually means threatened. It's kind of stronger than warned. Uh, so we know from the stoning of Stephen a few chapters later, this is not an idle threat. They actually would carry out something. They just didn't know at this time. And yet Peter and John respond brilliantly. They appeal to God. Who has the higher authority? Is it God or you? 
If you're both telling us different things of what to do, what am I supposed to do? That's basically what Peter says. Well, you're saying this. God's saying this. You guys are Jewish. What am I supposed to do? They have nothing. So basically what I can boil this down to a, a simple statement is this for you guys. We need to fear God more than we fear man. That's basically what this comes down to. What do we fear most? That's a proper perspective on fear. There's a lot of practical implications in your life that will be affected by the way you answer that question. Do I fear God more or do I fear man more? There's a lot of ramifications in your life depending on how you answer that. People pleasers and politically correct vanilla wafers that crave the approval of the world make terrible Christians. They just do. If you hold the values of pop culture in higher esteem than you hold the word of God, you don't fear God, you fear man. Even though you go to church, if basically the way of, of culture defines your life, if you take your cues and your marching orders from media, from academia, from Hollywood, you don't fear God, you fear man. Because you're obeying them. Whose approval in life do you crave the most? Whose approval are you seeking? Before social media, we knew that we desired the approval of others. We knew that. But now it's measurably quantified in the amount of followers and friends that you have and the number of likes that you earn. We live for a culture to pat us on the back and affirm us. We want to be Christians, but the cool kind of Christians that get to go hang out with Ellen DeGeneres and, and apologize for the church and ignore the fact that God has an opinion on sin. That's the kind of Christian that we want to be. We're told in the scriptures that we are to value God's opinions more highly than that of the world in the way that we order our lives. Proverbs 29 and 25 says, The fear of man lays a snare, but whoever trusts in the Lord is safe. Romans 1.16 says, I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God to salvation for anyone who believes. The issue of fear isn't being about, it's not about being scared. It's about obedience. Because if there's one thing we know, you will obey that which you fear. Right? You obey the things that you fear. If you fear man, you will obey man and never cross him. But if you fear God, you will obey God and never cross him. This is the issue with boldness. It's a very fickle thing. You can go from bold to afraid in a moment if you don't get what you're looking for. So let's say I have a message that I've prepared. Uh, let's say that I think God has given me this message. I've spent time in the scriptures and I feel confident that I'm standing on the authority of God. I go up to preach and I don't really get the response I was hoping for. It's kind of dead out there. People look at their watch and fall asleep. I get notes afterward. Hey, that was terrible. You should probably rethink your life. You know, all of that stuff. So what do I do with that? If I fear man, I will begin to change the way that I prepare messages because I didn't get the response that I wanted. It's kind of like when you put something out on social media, a couple hours goes by, you get zero likes. You go and delete your post because it would be terrible if anyone saw Jerry Kress, zero likes. Oh my goodness. It'd be terrible. But if you fear God more, all I can do is say, was I biblically faithful? Did I do what God called me to do? And did I prepare the best that I could in my own effort? If all those things are true, I gotta let the chips fall and let God be in control. That's how it goes in your life as you engage your friends and your family with the gospel and you proclaim Christ. If you fear man, listen to me, you'll never be bold. If you fear man, you'll never be bold. You gotta get it out of your system right now. You will not be cool, young people. It's the, the jigs up. You'll never be cool. As long as you're a Christian, it won't happen. You're not going to be embraced. You're not going to be brought on talk shows. You're not going to be befriended by all the powerful people of the world. No, you're a fool. You're an absolute fool. You need to get used to it right now. The world will see you as a fool. And if that bothers you, if, you're, if that shakes you to your core, you'll never boldly proclaim Christ. Because we have a countercultural message. We have to boldly proclaim Christ. Like what Peter and John said. We can't help but speak about this. My hands are tied, Jewish leaders. Sorry. I answer to a different authority. I'm going to do what i got to do. 
Because one day, I'm standing in front of you now. One day, I'm going to stand in front of God. And I feared that day way worse than I feared this day. That's what Peter and John said. So church, our mission is not just to proclaim Christ. It's to proclaim Him boldly. So I hope that you see boldness comes from proximity to Jesus, from personal experience, and a proper perspective of fear. You're going to feel the urge all your life to feel ashamed. I'll tell you right now, timid about your faith, about the God that saved your very soul. But our challenge is to resist that temptation to feel afraid because God did not give us a spirit of fear. Our challenge is to boldly proclaim Christ and his gospel and to trust in the power of the word. The gospel is best transmitted boldly. So I am not ashamed of the gospel. I hope that you can say that. I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for it is the power of God for my very salvation. Proclaim Christ boldly, church. Would you pray with me?